Welcome to this week's episode of the Everything Went Black podcast. My good friend Stefan Flam returns. Stefan is the main creative force in the band Godden. And uh, for those of you who listened to Metal Matters way back in the day, I interviewed all three members of this band when their last record came out, Beyond Darkness. And uh, you'll also remember that this record featured very highly on my top records of the year. Well, Godden is back with Veil of the Fallen, available on Svart Records. And uh, as this episode uh, premieres, it's literally on the eve of the release of that record. The pre-order is still up, so if you dig this band, definitely go out and get the vinyl. Um, there's two tracks, a single and uh, an intro that are available right now. And there's a video coming out for the song Urania. Steph and I get into it. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, he and I have been friends for several years, and it's always nice to catch up with him. If you're a fan of this show, you probably are aware that I am part of a group of elite content creators on the internet, known as the Horsemen of the Podcasting Apocalypse. Together, we wage a war on mediocrity in media. Kicking things off every other Monday... Brandon Legion brings you Horror Wolf 666. On Tuesday, every week, Jackie Smith brings you Into the Necrosphere, literally my favorite extreme music podcast in the land. Wednesday, of course, is Everything Went Black. I return on Thursday with Mike Scandato and Jeff Kashid for Necromaniacs Horror Podcast. Friday, Spitball Media comes down the pike. Featuring Mike Scandato's brother, John Draper. Saturday, of course, is a day off because, uh, you know, we need to get out there into the world and experience life. Sunday, Call Hikara brings us Soul Knox. Sunday is the second day that Call brings us episodes. It's Thursday and Sunday. And for all things dark, esoteric, and weird, check out Carl's show. Carl and I are also collaborating in a show called Darkness Weaves where we explore the work of Carl Edward Wagner. And operating on his own schedule, with no supervision whatsoever, Cheyenne of the great band Trivax brings us Iblis Manifestations. If you enjoy this uh, podcast and you want to support it beyond just uh, listening and sharing with your friends, you can do so by joining the Patreon and uh, for little as $1 a month, you can support the show and get access to bonus content. For $5 a month, you get the bonus content plus early access to the regular episodes. And for $25 a month, you can become a sponsor. And uh, recently, we just had the first ever Patreon Zoom hangout, and it was a lot of fun, man. We're going to be doing these things every now and then, every few months. We're, uh, we'll pick a time. We'll get up on the internet together on Zoom. And just talk. And it was a lot of fun, man. I got to be honest. Um, You know, initially it was kind of weird having everyone out there just kind of looking at each other. (laughs) But soon, you know, just we got good people, man. Good people are involved in this thing, man. And it's and it's it's awesome. So. uh, So, yeah. And here we go. Welcome back. It was great. Great seeing you. again. Hey, Mike, what's going on? Yeah, good seeing you, too. It's been a while. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame, man. You know, it's like time flies like so quickly these days, it seems maybe, maybe it's our age, you know, but like the years just seem to like fly right by us. And, uh, but it literally felt like, like months ago that you and I spoke last. Oh, totally. Yeah. The last, the last few years has definitely been like a challenging time for sure for me. And, um, but yeah, it's definitely flew by. So now, uh, you know, the good news is that it's time for another Godden record. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's, I know you and I have been, you know, discussing this for a while. So I knew that there was one in the works. And, um, you know, there, there's just some behind the scenes stuff you and I were talking about. And, uh, but I'm glad to see that the new LP is literally just about to surface and rear its head. 
uh, beforehand, there's been a single and a video. No, I, actually, is the video live? Because I, I know I've seen you sh sent me the video, but is that is that live at the? the yeah, level? the video is not live yet. It, you just got a little bit of an advanced peek at it. Um, that's uh, the record comes out May seventeenth, and I think we're gonna the video is gonna probably premiere before that. And um, yeah, so and that video is all DIY, man. That's like us with a bunch of iPhones and shit. <laughs> You know, no, it looks together. great. <laughs> no, it looks it looks, it looks totally pro, and I guess that's that's the beauty of of uh, technology these days is that you can um you can do things that you could never do like twenty years ago. Like for example, when winter was active, we you, we would never be able to see a video of that quality. You know, like back in the eighties and nineties, and now consumer technology, you can create something that looks professionally filmed and edited. It's, it's insane. Yeah, totally. I mean, the whole garden record is all done right here in this room. Like, this is like basically my studio. And, you know, I mean, everything was, you know, tracked to like, you know, MacBook Pro, you know, and some hard drives and stuff, you know, never would have been able to make a record like that, you know, 1988, you know, 89 or whatever it was. And um, I think it's beautiful. I think it's great. I think it's the best thing that ever happened to music. Totally. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, because we're, you know, Steph and I are speaking uh, on the video here. So I get a, I'm getting a peek at where all the magic happens. And uh, it's a pretty impressive setup, man. You got a bunch of different, uh, you know, um, interfaces and, you know, it looks like a couple of compressors there. Yeah. Oh, cool. Dual, dual monitor. Yeah. I'll give you the, uh, I'll give you the, the view. Hold on. So I turn my screen on. Oops, sorry about that, guys. Yeah, this is where it all happens, man. I got like, we talked all the time. That's it, basically, man. I use a bunch of pods, XTs. You know, I use my native instruments, keyboard. You know, just Mackie, a couple of monitors, a couple of Macs. This is my control room where we track everything. Behind me is a uh, control room. There's glass that goes into the other room. That's where I have all the amps and stuff set up. And um, that's big, obviously kettlebells and shit because I work out in here. But, um, you know, that's it, basically. That's what I look at. Beautiful, man. Nice. And, uh, yeah, it's all my CDs. My New York City subway map <laughs> to make me feel at home. And, uh, the other room is basically it. I, you know, I have rectifiers and shit set up in here. Just an attic that I converted. You know? Pedal boards and all my toys. Whoops, sorry about that. Old school MXL kit. Just some amps and shit. And um, it's basically it, you know? Keep it super simple. Rehearse it. Record it. Right now it's taken apart because I'm kind of rebuilding it for the next record. And um, that's it. That's, you know, simple. Don't know do much. You track the drums in there too? So the new, the new, I know we talk, we, we always, yeah. me and you always geek out about the recording process because I am, I am much into the recording process. I think that's the whole beauty of like what we're doing in this day and age a little bit. Jason, because we were during COVID, we had to ch change our typical way of working. Traditionally, Jason would, uh, would fly in from either Colorado or Boston where he was living and he would meet me at Tony's. And, you know, we would track a song, we'd record it, put it on the shelf and then move on. And then we had a couple of songs he would fly in and we kind of did. And there three different drummers on the first record. Yeah. Um, and then I really like working with Jason. He's a pretty astute guy. And he's also like a studio musician on his own. And he also records. So he was the easiest to work with. And I just liked his style. And I continued working with him for the whole this whole new record. So we, because of COVID, I mean, Beyond Darkness came out like basically, what was that, May 20, uh, 2020 or something like it, right in the beginning of COVID. So no one can get together. And we used to go to Tony's place. During that time period, you no know, vaccine, New York was completely upside down. So because we were all in isolation, I said, you know, let's continue making music. We can't really go anywhere. We're all like trapped in our houses anyway. How do you want to do this? So me and Jason decided that um, he would track the drums in Colorado. 
I do a lot of drum programming and stuff because I always did that with Thorne and, and Roy Mayorga and all those guys. So I would kind of program what I liked and I'd be like, hey, I'm not really a drummer, but could you like humanize this? This is what I'm thinking. These are the structures of the songs. And then he would, you know, usually be locked to a grid, usually something just so we could all work together. It's not like all over the place. And um, he said, how do you want to do it? I said, well, it's I noticed that when we did the first record, we, we tracked everything with that drum kit that was at Tony's. It was double kit, everything. And then um, when we were going to mix the record, because it was three different drummers, when we went to mix the record, Roy, who mixed it, who is a drummer, he said, Steph, it's not going to be consistent in your record. You have three different drummers. Everyone's using their own snare drum. Everyone's got their own cymbals. He goes, it's not going to be consistent. I said, so what do you suggest? He goes, I want to sound replace a few things. I said, no, 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 you can't do that. You're going to kill the record. I want it to be organic. He goes, it is organic. He goes, it's the performances. All I'm doing is just changing the sound on it. I'm not going to change anything on it. I promise you. It'll, just trust me on this. He goes, I'm a drummer. I'm not just an engineer. So if there's anyone I could trust, and I was very anti doing it that way. You know, I wanted what was recorded, what was in the room at that time, because that was the vibe. He said, trust me, all that's going to be there. So he, he sound replaced a couple of items and it really made the record pop. And I was like, oh, it does sound more consistent. He says, listen to these two songs back to back. He goes, I, I can't fix that. So it's completely different snare drum sound. So I trusted him on that. So then when we went to the new record. We couldn't really get together. Jason was living in an environment where he couldn't have a real drum kit. So we decided to just use uh, software to do. We used Steve Slate drums and he used actually a V drum kit. And he played it on V drums. And then later we we made our own proprietary kit. Me and Jason spent like a month just literally sending drum tracks back and forth. And till we found the, just the right kick drum, the right snare drum. And we made a kit for God. We have the proprietary kit that we used for the project. And um, we tracked it like that, believe it or not. And um, the record was made in complete isolation. There was really no cho no other way to really um configure it i guess uh so that's how we did it and uh, vas always records on her own she's got her own little studio and like she lives in tribeca and everyone has like their own little you know project studio so we just trusted and we just sent the tracks back and forth but that we did do it that way and then i told roy hey here's our proprietary kit we made and um we use that as kind of like the template and going forward i'm going to continue to do it that way I think um i mean there'll be some stuff where we're now now covid's kind of over it's kind of in the rear view mirror we, you know we could everyone can come here and then we could we could do it old school i like being in the room with people and that part of it i don't necessarily love but we didn't have a choice <clears throat> so we just did what we had and um so drums yes they were done totally with like we used steve slate drums made our own kit and i didn't use all the pods and rectifiers this time around either i used more software based stuff and just made my own sounds well they got great mind. stuff these days. they have excellent amp modeling software which um you know a lot of the last like uh well in, in the demo phase for tombs everything's software modeled as far as amps go and on the the last release we did um that uh ex oblivion like single little secret that whole thing was with models amp modelers that wasn't even live amps you know live on that was the drums you know so yeah or or you know reported acoustically was the drums and also ray mayorga for you guys out there who may or may not know is a consummate professional when it comes to drums and recording and if i was going to trust anyone about drums i would trust ray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you could trust anyone about drums or knows anything about drums and doing it that way that's the guy. I mean, he's a drummer for Ministry right now. I mean, uh, yeah. I think he just did the new Melvin's record too. He just played on yeah. that too. So um, yeah, he, he's the guy. <laughs> he is definitely the guy. It, I wouldn't have trusted anyone else but him. But a uh, friend as well as super talented motherfucker for sure. So as we're recording this, uh, the record is just, it's still on pre order uh, and it's about to be released. Uh, and I, I ordered a copy of the vinyl from, uh, from Svart and, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting that at some point since I have vinyl of the first album, you know, keep the set complete. Uh, so right now there was a, a, a single 
the I guess the title track, uh, Veil of the Fallen, is the name of the single that was out, and this video is about to come out. And I've had the privilege of uh, listening to the entire record a few times uh, as we before we spoke, speak or whatever. Whenever you guys are listening to the conversation, will be over with, so it's past tense, I guess. Um, and I, I got to say, there's a different. It's definitely, and, and this is the thing as as someone who makes their own music. You know, when I listen to bands and their records and their progression. I like when there's a um, a difference between the records where you can go, okay, this is the, uh, you know, the era that they were doing this. And then there's the era on this album. And I definitely feel that e even despite the fact that I do love bands who make the same album over and over again, you know, like a lot of death metal bands, like Deicide, you know, Cannibal Corpse. <laughs> it's like, okay, cool. We're doing, we're putting our, our coat on to make this and we're going to do it. And it sounds sick, but um garden is like a different animal completely because there's more of like a, a conceptual element to it and um uh it feels very much like there's a different atmosphere and environment from record to, you know, between the two records and the new album to me almost feels more like on this kind of like psychedelic sort of vibe to it you know the synths are a lot more prominent in some of the tracks like uh you know the violin you know black vortex has that uh really sick like violin part that and I, and I take and this is a compliment they're almost as like a led zeppelin physical graffiti like song you know what i mean vibe to it i don't know it's just me and i because i love led zeppelin and when they got really into the layering and the production of their records later on i think that's some of the best produced hard rock there is you know and some of the material on this record because of the different layers and and the, the the strings and the more prominent synthesizers in there that's keyboards i think it's like pushing it into that more of like a like a composition almost as opposed to just like some heavy metal songs you know what i mean totally yeah i feel like it's more distilled um the first record was a lot of older material that I had written for winter right and yeah. sitting around for you know a decade more because so i originally made a made a whole winter record that just was a demo that never really went anywhere so a lot of that was music that was kind of left over so it had a little more of a doom vibe to it <clears throat> but moving forward um there were certain things on the i didn't want to repeat if you notice there's really no there's not one guitar solo on the whole album and having margaret the violinist i felt I wanted any place where there could be some kind of guitar solo or something. I wanted violin. And um, the, I, the song structures, I wanted them to be a little bit more concise and not like a lot of the songs, the first album, some of them like eight minutes long. So I was trying to, you know, trim them down and just get like, the you know, the bones of the song and really kind of focus on that. And um yeah, and we went, uh, the 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 bass is more dominant on this record. It's um, you know I play bass, I play guitar, and I write the music part of it. And I actually like playing bass as much as I like playing guitar for me. So I kind of kind of wanted to bring a little bit more of that forward, and um, I wanted it to be more like sonically to sound a little bit more like if you listen, you know, if you listen to like ACDC, Back in Black, you can play that record on any stereo. And it's like, it sounds great, whether it's a transistor radio or it's like a big nightclub, with so, you know, massive subwoofers. And um, when I said to Roy, he goes, what do you want the record to sound like? And that's actually what I said. I said, I want to be like that in black. He goes, well, that's that's a drum center, kick drum center, kick drum snare center. If that's what you want, then it's got to be built around that. I said, that's what I think I want for this record. I want that kind of like that separation between the instruments you know, when you listen to those records, I want that very concise. I want you to really cut it out so, so that the listener has that ex that kind of similar experience when they listen to the record. Instead of it being like this super raw thing where everything's kind of mashed together and it's like a big mass, I did want to have that kind of like clarity with the record so that you could hear everything. I know we all try to make our records as clear as could be, but there's that that's a way of thinking when you start mixing you you start saying okay if that's what you if that's what you're looking for it has to be mixed from the ground up like that so yeah that, there was definitely a more distilled kind of feeling um kind of going for this 
definitely you can hear that and, and it's cool that you said acdc back in black that's literally one of my favorite records of all time and um as of right now we got a bunch of bunch of listeners from australia and i know everyone uh the australians acdc is like like the elvis presley of uh australian rock music you know what i mean totally so every Australian guy I know loves ACDC. So there you go. There you got some fans probably as a result of that statement, you know. Yeah. But but um, but on a deeper level, like how am I going to put this? It's like you and I started plinking, making music in like small spaces with like our friends, and just immediate this very immediate, like do it now, get it done concise way of make writing songs so that's how you and i feel like we started playing music that way mm -hmm. and maybe we we listened to stuff from the 70s while we were doing that but it took years to get to a point where maybe we're able to execute that sort of stuff because now i like I, there was a point a few months ago where i was listening to um heroes by david bowie and uh and i was like you know that robert fripp is on that record so you know it's a brian oh. eno kind of thing and um I was listening and I heard all these parts in there that I was thinking to myself, I'm like, yeah, this is like production composition, you know? And um, it's not just a bunch of dudes in a basement, like playing, you know, four chord, like punk songs, you know what I mean? And there's like an element to it that maybe was derived from that. Um, but also evolved into a, a like a, a more, uh, enlightened sort of sense and i feel like especially on this record i get the vibe of like it being and maybe it's because of uh the way it was produced because you guys are in different locations and then you have more time to reflect on the material and absorb what you're doing and make judgment calls on parts and things like that but that's when i when i when i listen to this record i hear so much more like production and composition involved in it you know and like you were saying like you want the songs to be more concise but maybe like in arrangements it's more concise but the overall listener experience i feel is way more like like produced or there's more composition in mind and more layering and more parts and things like that you know it's really interesting you know yeah it's a much more highly produced record than the first one yeah totally uh, it, it is it, it's um I mean, working with Jason was great. I mean, we basically, I mean, listen, I, I don't just listen to metal, you know, like some yeah. of the stuff I love is like James Brown's in like top three, you know what I mean? So when I listen to those, like, you know, something by like James Brown or something, there's something that's hypnotic about some of those records where you're in this, you get like this kind of groove that kind of takes you with it. And it's, you don't even realize it, but you're, you're going along with this rhythm. I said to Jason, I said, I really want to kind of have that feel. And that's very similar to like we were talking about the back and black thing. Like all those records have a very specific, like almost like a metronome kind of like locked it in kind of kind of vibe with it with a listener's experiences. They're in this kind of groove. You know, you listen to Jane Brown, like make it funky or something. I mean, all they're doing is dan and it has like this thing that's kind of going on. He probably repeats it 300 times while he's on top of it. Yeah. you know, or great hip hop records. I mean, basically there's not much even really going on with it, but they could be heavy as hell, some a hip hop record, right? You know, with the production. I mean, I mean, I don't give a shit if it's 50 Cent or it's Public Enemy or who, whoever it is, but there's something that's rhythm that there that's happening that's heavy, rhythmically. So I did want to, I wanted that to be part of the record. So when I was concising it down, sure there were riffs that kind of went out and I'd be like, Jason would do some great fill. I'm like, dude, lose the fill because the fill is literally taken away or, or if you're going to put the fill there, I don't give a shit. If you go on the back and you do you keep the hi hat, keep going, keep your timekeeper, keep going. You want to do the fill. You could do the fill, but keep the, keep the hi hat going, do another track of it so that the listener that never changes for them. That is always part of the structure of the song. You could do your fill, but I don't want you breaking away from the hi hat or the ride or whatever you're doing to do some fill. Let it let the timekeeper go. You want to put the thing in the background. Your your fill, go right ahead. But I need the I want I need the timekeeper. So Jason totally got that. He was like, no, I, I totally get what you're saying. So that was one of the reasons I really liked working with him because he was really, when I explained it to him, he totally got it. He's also a very astute musician. He's like a Berkeley musician. You know what I mean? You know, so he was um, playing this kind of music, 
he gets it, but he also gets it from a, from a from like a different kind of understanding of music. You know what I mean? So, um, but yeah, that's that's was kind of my feeling on it. You know? Yeah, you know, and that and that comes from like that that the ability to do that. Like you know, it, it comes from years of experience and maturity too. Because like you know, you know, you probably experience the same thing with like band members where you listen into the song, but then this dude's got this part that he loves, you know, where it's like, it's like, this doesn't work for the song. It just works to boost your ego as a player or something like that, you know? And it's like, you know, that's, that's the thing you have to let go of. Like, even as, even for myself, my own songwriting, it's like, it's hard to like, you write something and automatically you fall in love with it. And you're like, Oh, it's like, you know, but then you have to look at it with like a brutal honesty sometimes, you know what I mean? And be like, yeah, this kind of sucks, or like, this doesn't really, this works against the song, you know? And it takes a lot because, like, when you first, if you don't have the experience of making music, you just want to hang on to everything and clutch on to these parts with, like, you know, passion. So it does take a lot, and especially drummers, too, man. Like, you know, yeah, you know, I play with a lot of different types of drummers and, you know, guys that are like, you know, really into playing fills and they don't want to cut any of that out or they play a different the song different every single time or whatever you know and it's like it's really it's really uh a testament to the maturity of the uh musician someone who can let go of these things and and work for the betterment of the song you know and that that's that i guess that's one of the other aspects of this record is i feel like there was like no ego involved in it it was all just really trying to like make the song itself like an excellent, you know, listening experience. And that's the one thing, one thing to go about. Um, like in general, I don't really care so much for, uh, you know, like, like big major label style music, you know, it's going all the way back to the, to the nineties, you know, it's like, you know, you listen to Nevermind by Nirvana and it feels like 70 people were involved in making Nevermind, you know, and some producer is like, Oh no, we got to take this part out. But there is a validity to that, which I which is good when the band is executing it, you know, when there is like an overview, like a project management element to it, where they're like, okay, this is the song. I don't care about your bass line. I don't care about like the solo that you wrote. It has to all work together as one piece. And that's definitely what I feel on this record for sure. There's a lot to be said for that as a as like when producers and people get involved in the making of a record because they hear it through their filter. Like, I think Andy Wallace did, um, uh, Never mind. was it Andy Wallace? I can't remember. Um, but when you listen to certain records, like, like I was listening to an interview with Edgar Winter in the song Frankenstein. Yeah. And he was saying in the interview that like, if you watch the live version of that song, of them playing it, and then you listen to the original song, it'll blow your mind because the original song is like almost eight minutes long, but they were trying to get that song radio play. So, when you listen to the live version, each bar of the song uh, might be like 16 bars and Edgar Wintz is playing like three instruments. He's running back and forth, right? He plays saxophone. I think he plays uh, some kind of percussion and he also plays keyboard. So he's running back and forth on the stage, right? And he needs enough time to go from one instrument to the other, right? I think Rick Derringer is playing guitar on that too, by the way. And um, so the person who produced that, they called the song Frankenstein because they chopped it up so much in the studio to concise it down to something that would be radio friendly. But a person like me loves the live version because there's a lot of other stuff that's in there and I understand the original song. But if I play that song for like my wife, she's into music, but she's like, it gets boring to me. Yeah. She, like, she likes the studio version because she she's like, it's too much for me. It's overload, you know, there's too much stuff going on. There's a beauty in people who are really good producers, I think, when they make records, they know how to distill it down to what the what they're trying to get across. Musicians get so caught up in their own their own like vibe sometimes of what they're doing, sometimes because it's like an ego thing, but sometimes because uh, they get caught up in, in some of the little nuances and, and sometimes those little nuances, they don't even translate to, to the regular listener. Same thing happened when I watched a James Brown movie, right? When the musicians were like, well, why are we doing it that way? And James like, no, hold it down. Hold down the rhythm. I don't give a shit if you do the funky drummer beat for the whole fucking song. Just do what I'm telling you. And they were like, yeah, yeah. And, and then all of a sudden, everyone was getting it, right? It was dance music. 
you can't have all that other stuff. He was trying to create exactly. something, gave you this swirling kind of feel that kind of pulled you in and it was hypnotic. So sometimes one person has to have a vision of the direction that it's going to go. There are a lot of records like that where there's a certain vibe, like Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, very special record because Miles had a vision of where he wanted to go. He took all those musicians. He says, you guys play traditional instruments. Yo, Herbie, you know, Joe Zal, you guys are not going to be playing a regular organ. You're going to plug that shit through a distortion pedal and a fucking wah pedal and all kinds of shit. And I'm going for something. He had a vision. So I think sometimes you have to think about what are you really trying to put across? So with the Garden record, that was very specific. Sure, my, the rhythms I could have made, I, some of the riffs were completely simplified massively because I'm like thinking about the part where I'm like, I close my eyes, listen to it as a listener. And I'm saying, hey, this is what I'm, what's the part that's really making me get pulling me in? It's not that little extra little thing I'm doing on the guitar that's making the riff good. Like, you know, when you listen to like Black Vortex, it's the simplest riff on the planet. But it's not about the guitar. It's about a rhythm section that's moving forward so that when Voss is singing, she has something, a foundation that's underneath that she could sing over. She's the vocal point. And also I brought the vocals way louder than on the first record too. Yeah, yeah, she's, she's, the, she's way up front. I mean, you can hear the little grizzle in her voice. Like when you listen to Veil of the Fallen, that mic is like super close up to her. And I just wanted dead space. Almost every time is a hit, drum thing, then there's her vocals and there's a hit. And there's like open space. I really wanted that to be like as if her voice was jumping out of the speakers and kind of like right up in your face. But if you make the riffs really complicated, you you lose some of that. It needed to be simple. So that was the distillation part of it. I it that, that was very conscious to kind of to kind of do that. And um, um, some of the bass stuff, I didn't even use a regular bass for. I just used like a moog because it was much simpler sonic thing that didn't interfere, you know, like some of the things have distorted bases and stuff like that, but there's nothing, there's nothing stronger than a fucking sine wave bass. You know what I mean? From like a Moog or oh, something yeah. to you, like on Urania, that's straight up. It's just a Moog, you know, Tony's playing a Moog, like old school seventies Moog. And Tony's like, you sure you want that? I don't like, like really hear it, hear it. And I'm like, if you listen to ACDC, like we'll go back to that. Back in black, the bass is there. You're not necessarily sonically hearing it, but it's the undercurrent of the whole song. It's there. It's not like a mid rangey kind of bass, you know? So he's like, okay. And then when it was all put together, I'm like, you got to leave breathing space for the different instruments as you're laying them. If they're all kind of like, like too tightly wound like that, I don't know. It doesn't, you have to leave some kind of space in there. So I did use some keyboard basses on it where I just played them. Instead of, I played originally with the bass and I was like, I was going to play it with the key, but I'm like, oh, this is way better because now the guitar could stand out. It's totally not even in the frequency of the guitars anymore. And um, I, th I think some of that was kind of important for the, the distillation process, we'll call it, of the, of the record. Yeah, see, that's, that's the thing too about like, when, especially in like slower, heavier kind of like doom influenced music where um, everyone wants to be low end the guitars want to be low end, but the guitars aren't designed to be in a certain frequency and the bass is designed to have that frequency, you know? And, you know, with a stringed instrument, it's only like, like it almost makes more sense to use a, a keyboard or a synthesizer for those lower. Cause you guys are tuning to like a or something like that. Right. Is that yeah. What that was? And, uh, a then baritone yeah. too. Oh, the baritone. Yeah. So, yeah. So y even your guitar, the, the the mechanics of a baritone guitar is different than a, a standard scale six string, you know, where it doesn't hold that intonation at the lower, uh, you know, tunings. So, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I, you know, the doors, they had, you know, Ray Raymond Zarek played all the bass lines, you know That's what right, I mean? There's on his, no on his keyboard. <laughs> yeah, they didn't even have a bass player, you know? So, yeah, it, it, it makes sense for, for this type of music to do that, you know? Yeah, that was, um, that was, and, and I really loved using, and I, we switched over using native instruments and I, uh, I, I enjoyed using that too. The, um, some of the sounds in there, orchestral stuff. Tony, yeah, I gotta, was play, like, I gotta yeah. play around like that stuff. I, I had just started to kind of like scratch the surface of native instruments, you know, those, the tools they have available. Yeah, it was cool. It was good for someone like Tony too, because, you know, he's really traditional. He used his old, you know, our Selena string ensembles and I have an old K2000 that he loves and 
and you know he has his organs and all this stuff but one night i was just over at his place and i'm like i'm like just give it a chance and i started like to him he has no idea how to use the software or anything i literally sit next to him and i go through the patches or whatever and for him it like totally opened up his mind like he started playing stuff and i was like yo yo just because he heard a certain sound made him play a certain thing yeah. sometimes you're influenced by a certain sound makes you play something a little bit differently and it totally started opening up his mind and um that's how the manifestation i guess nine was kind of came into playing because he was just playing and he's like oh my god this reminds me of like some old horror movie or something he's totally into like horror movie you know yeah. soundtracks and shit so so he was like wow that's kind of creepy sounding and I, all i would do whenever i sit with tony i just hit record don't even tell him i'm hitting record and um so yeah, it was it was um, definitely it's like a new instrument, and I, you know I don't get caught up in the whole thing like everyone's oh it's a it's a plug in or it's this it's just sound it doesn't matter whether it's what the sound comes from, and um, yeah so that was kind of I found that helpful for the new record because I didn't use that on the first record at all it was that was all like whatever was in Tony's basement so um, yeah and that opening track with him believe it or not is. We were at St. John Divine when we were shooting, doing some photo shoots, and Ava Petrick had an art exhibit that was in Soho or something, and they had a piano where she had taken all the uh, this lace and put it all over the piano, and it was it was at another location, and she asked them to deliver the piano to St. John Divine and put it in the garden because we were going to shoot some video shoots there, and uh, we had permission and everything to do. We brought the piano there. And Tony, just like while everyone was setting up and doing stuff, he was playing the piano, just went, just sat down, you know, he was just killing time. And the intro of that record is him just playing. I literally heard him playing. Whoa, that's pretty beautiful what he's doing. I didn't say anything. I took my iPhone memo pad, slid it right behind the piano and recorded it. Oh, yeah. And then when I, yo, yo, can you do another take of that? He goes, I have no idea what I even played. <laughs> I'm awesome. like, what do you mean? He goes, I, 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 he tried to do it. He couldn't do it. <laughs> it was really weird. He goes, I don't know, man. I just sat behind the piano. I looked into the garden and St. John the Vine, you know, where that creepy thing is with like the lobster hand and stuff. It was like that big garden right there. The piano was set up right in front of it. He goes, I just sat down at the piano and, I'm, and it was, I just started playing. I would just took in, there was like birds that you could hear, even hear the birds in the background on the recording. It was just like birds on the tree, just chirping. We couldn't take it off the recording because it was embedded in the recording. So he, um, so you, some, and I says, well, what made you do? Because I don't know. He goes, he goes, you know, the key, this piano is a little bit out of tune, by the way. I don't know if you could hear it. I can't hear it, but he could hear it. He's got like perfect pitch, the guy. And he's like, yeah, it was a little bit out of tune. So it was a little quirky sounding. So I kind of went with it. So that's like a good example of you just sit behind a certain instrument, you pick it up and it influences you to play something. If I would have put him behind a, the Kurzweil, he wouldn't have played something pretty like that. He just happened to be at a piano in the garden right there. So he played that. And then, um, yeah, and then I sent that to um, Margaret, the violinist. I said, what do you think of this? She goes, oh, my God, it's beautiful. I love what he played. Can he replay it? Because the piano is out of tune. And I said, you know, because you're talking about she's actually a music teacher. She teaches yes. up in the Finger Lake somewhere. So and I says, no, he can't replay it. She goes, why not? I go, because the piano doesn't exist anymore. I told her what I just told you. And she goes, you know what? It's kind of quirky and kind of like like a it sounds like um you know like an old recording kind of you know that's kind of like not playing at the right speed on a tape or something it's a little off so yeah sometimes different instruments make us play or conjure up different thought so anyway <laughs> i remember back when um metal matters when we did i think the first time we spoke about the band you know i i, I talked to all all three of you guys and um you know i spoke yes. with him for a while and is he still involved in the lyric writing process too? Because I know Tony and I, we talked a lot about like the, the cosmic horror stuff that we're both into like Robert Block and Lovecraft and all this other stuff. And a lot of his influences and his writing and stuff seems, you know, like aligns with my kind of thing too. So is he still involved in like in, in writing lyrics on, on this record? So any of the songs that Voss sings, she writes the lyrics for. Okay. So, so any song she writes lyrics um the manifest the manifestation thing on the first album we had eight of them 
I know we were geeking out with it and having fun with it, but I think for a lot of people, it was a little overkill. They felt it broke up the album a little bit too much, the groove. That's fine. Um, I mean, it's a double album, right? If you don't like yeah. those songs in your iPod, you just don't put them in on your, make the mix how you like it, you know? But we felt like we wanted to give you kind of like this story thing. Tony, he's a writer. Like, he, yeah. whether he's writing lyrics or not, he literally has a pile of things he writes. He just likes to write. I think he was supposed to be an English teacher or something when he was younger. So he just likes literature. He's always reading and and um, always has ideas. So he was he was really helpful for me because I don't have that skill whatsoever. So I would tell my concepts and he'd write them. So he did write Manifestation 9, the, the one that's on this record, but we decided just to do one, make it a little longer, concise it down, and all the rest of the story that he wrote will be on the Godin website. If anyone wants to geek out and read his whole thing, Tony could have it because I'm all about letting people be creative and do their do their you know their art or what they want to do. But so Tony, you, if you want to continue with this concept, so Manifestation Nine is just like a small touch of like a larger story of like almost like a book that he's kind of putting together. And he's like, that's cool. He goes, I get it. He saw the reviews. He's, he's not, he's a very open, he's probably one of the most open-minded people I know when it comes to that. He goes, I get it. I know I'm geeking out, but there are geeks out there that will like with this and there are some that won't. So we'll put one on there. Now he did write the lyrics for, there's a hidden track, well not really hidden, but there's a bonus track on the Godin record called uh, Majestic Symphony. Majestic Symphony is not Godin. Majestic Symphony is a project I have called Conductor of Lightning. Oh, okay. And that's with um, the musicians from, it's me, Tony, and Jason. And right after we put Beyond Darkness out, Ava wanted me to write her some music for her own personal project that she has. And it's completely different music. It's like electronic music, you know? I have, like, I write other kinds of music besides this. And so I was writing her some music. And next thing, but sometimes, I guess, even though that being said it sometimes it still comes out, out like some dark menacing beast that jumps out anyway because it's kind of in my dna you know just because i choose certain notes so we made that song i wrote the music for that and she wrote lyrics and then tony's like no 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 no. let me rewrite the lyrics for that so he did write the lyrics for ava that she sings for that like ava and they kind of collaborated and then tony distilled it down and rewrote them so that song is different that's not a god in track at all it, it's it's just the song's been around since 2019 i had no we had no place to put it so when we were done mixing the record i said hey roy can you can you mix this track I want, we have extra space on the album let's just throw it on there like punk rock you know like a flip we have like one one group on one side one on the other and um so yeah that uh not to get sidetracked but tony wrote the lyrics for that song with ava and I mean, um I thought that stuff was really cool. And, and and then I'm one of the guys who did like all the interludes on the first record. You know what I mean? I'm that's right up my alley. Like I love all that <laughs> stuff, you know? And I mean, uh, Sam Hain used to have like, I mean, way different, but there was always like, like Glenn would do that too. Like in some of the early, early like Sam Hain records, you know, he'd have this little thing he would say, and then the song starts. So it's not like completely out of left field, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, I, I'd be interested in reading the book. You know, I think that the, uh, the subject matter and you know the voice on all on, on Tony's work is is interesting to me, you know, and, and I think that's awesome. It'd be great if you guys could put out like some limited print copy of that or something with some artwork or whatever. I'd be down for that, you know. Yeah, he would he would totally do it. I mean, that's that's where his where his head's at, you know. He like he likes literature. That's his I mean he's read like tons of science fiction books. Well, you guys had spoke during the interview. Yeah. Um we'll talk to you for 10 hours about that stuff. That's his thing, you know. Actually, you know what I should do is uh, our our conversation was like three times longer than what I, I was allowed on that website on that. When I was doing that podcast, that was my I own. That wasn't my that wasn't my <laughs> production. That was like the give me radio production. So they had they gave me like time limits on everything. Sure, sure. So I need I need to get that audio up for everything with black listeners because I think they would appreciate what we talked about more like the other two thirds of the conversation that didn't see the light of day needs to come out. I think maybe just on Patreon or something like that, you know, okay. nah, I enjoyed it though. I had a, I had a blast talking to Tony. It was awesome. Yeah. He's, he's, an, unusual, he's an unusual cat for sure. Yeah. 
So how did you um how did you guys meet um the, the violin player? She's someone that was in your circle or you know. So um Steve Murphy and Carl from uh, Kings Destroy. That is Steve Murphy's sister. Oh, okay. So I went to a, a party that um I think it was maybe a birthday party or something that Steve had. And I met his sister. I was like sitting next to her and he's and I totally hit it off with her. You know, she's like she's not into metal or anything, she's like classical music, you know. And I don't know, she's like, I play violin. And I'm like, oh, cool, you know, you know, fellow musician, whatever. And then next thing you know, out of nowhere, I'm like, hey, you want to um want to play one of my songs? She's like, what kind of music is it? And I'm like, it's metal. She's like, I've never played heavy metal before. And I'm like, doesn't matter what it is, you know. So she says, yeah, sure. And um, she's like, I'm going to I'm going to be at my brother's in like a couple of weeks again for something. Yeah, come on by. Grab my MacBook, grab like the 414 mic stand, put some headphones on her, center the track. And I think she played on Come Susa Toad and uh, a couple of other songs on the first record. And um, it's so funny. She came she, she wrote like everything out. Like, oh, really? Like, like, got charts and everything. <laughs> she's like, she's like asking me questions. What are you playing here? I'm like, oh, man. I don't know. It sounds good to me. I have no idea what the fuck it is. You know, I'm like, if you want to talk legit what I'm playing, ask Tony. He'll tell you the exact chords I'm playing. You know, he's like, he's the guy who keeps it real, you know? So she came and she played on it. And then we became really good friends. And like, to her, it was exciting because, you know, she plays with classical musicians. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, she was really easy. It was just because she's a musician. I meet people all the time that play different instruments, that play stuff. And um, if, you know, not you're just trying to create different colors, right? Something different. That was like the whole reason why I didn't do guitar solos on this record. Because I'm like, everyone does guitar solos. It's almost like standard, right? Yeah, you want to do something out of that's a little bit left of center for sure. Yeah. yeah, so I kind of became friendly with her and then she just kind of played it. And now she's, every time I get a song, I, if I hear like violin in my head or whatever, sometimes Tony actually writes string lines and he'll he'll say, yo, send this to Margaret because this will definitely sound better if she plays the song on a violin than me with my fingers because of the vibrato and stuff. So yeah. sometimes we'll write parts with her, like with her in mind. Um, and then I just let her rip. Like I think her, I think her solo in Veil of the Fallen is great. I think what she does at the end of that song is fucking awesome. You know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, like I said, for me personally, the more I, I love layers like that, you know, and um, you know, and and you know, being a fan of like stuff from the seventies, you know, where where there was like like Deep Purple and like Zeppelin and all that, they, you know, Rainbow, like they they didn't shy away from like cool like production ideas like that, and and I love when that gets sort of introduced to more modern music you know where you know especially like like the style that that Godin's playing which is so open and filled with space that it allows the presence of things like that to really contribute to the song yeah i think it was a i think it was a great collaboration contribution to the record i'll continue to you know have her be part of it going forward i think right now it's the people that are part of it at this point now i think this is the core the core people that'll be moving forward but i'm always open to having other people come in and and you know add some other colors in there things i don't do i don't play violin i don't play keyboard i mean i can mess around with the keyboard i don't know what the hell i'm doing though but um yeah i'm always open to having different people um collaborate in there with us one of the things that's funny though i totally related to you on was like not knowing anything about the guitar you know it's like like when it comes to writing like actual music theory, it's like uh, like I'm pretty good with like time signatures and things like that, you know, like rhythmic stuff, you know, and like maybe the key that something's in, but all the different chord configurations and like, oh yeah, what are you doing over here? Like, I don't know, I, I, I'm doing this, this thing over here, you know? And and uh, so like when an actual musician asks me about the material and the technical aspects of it, I'm like, I don't know. It, it, it's the thing that's like this, you know, and like I'll show them on the guitar or whatever, you know, because like it's always it's funny though. you think for me personally, I'm like, yeah, I, I play guitar. But I'm like, the reality is like I have no idea what the hell I'm doing half of the time, you know? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I, I feel that way, too. Sometimes um, I do think there's a certain like you can't break the rules unless you know the rules. Yeah. But there's also um, there are a lot of things that I tend to do when I'm putting structures of songs together being with tony because he he is a very schooled musician 
he already he says when he listens to my riffs or different ideas and like like a good example like we were just talking about margaret margaret's like well what are you playing there i'm not really sure and we were all together it was me tony voss we went up to the finger lakes whatever and i couldn't explain to her what i was doing right tony goes he's doing a flatted fifth blah 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 blah, blah. and he told her like the kim he goes stefan always does that that's like his thing he like you know um and margaret's like well what do you mean he goes you know the so and tony's like you know the song black savage is like i have no idea what the hell you're even talking about he goes well it's like it's like these two semitone things that kind of make things sound ominous and she's like what do you mean he goes there are two notes you can't play in church you cannot play those notes in a church or, or like Matt, I was a uh, Hendrix manic depression or songs like that where they have that dang eh, eh, it's like an interval it's a song black sabbath basically yeah, exactly. i mean it's what heavy metal is built upon basically right or robert fripp uses it or like diminished kind of things but he was technically explained and then he technically explained like something like what we're talking about like a language like if i say that to you you go oh yeah of course black sabbath right you say that to someone like margaret she's like what what the fuck are you talking about? Who's Black Sabbath? You know, she's coming from a completely different part of the planet. You know, I think I heard of them. You know, she doesn't know what that is. So there is, even though there's like, a, like, I might not know music theory, there are certain things that I gravitate towards, right? Because they sound good to me, necessarily. They don't sound happy, the notes that I'm looking for. Like sometimes Tony will play something, I'm like, too happy. He goes, I know you want it to be flat. <laughs> you know like he knows he, he gets like there is even though there's no rules or, or there are rules or whatever there's certain music genres that that's what makes them that genre right because they do certain if you're writing love songs you would never put those notes in a love song because those songs the, the, this kind of music we're making makes when you hear it you want to shove a knife in someone's back or kill them you know what i mean like it gives you it conjures up a different feeling there's a discord or something that happens in the music that makes us gravitate towards certain types of music. Some of it is a production thing and some of it is a strict like musical note selection and how you put string those notes together to, to get to a resolve or something or maybe not resolve it. And that's what gives it leaves the tension because you don't resolve the note to where it's supposed to go. Like you'll never hear me use a blues progression thing because it's like, why? For what reason? It's been done 10 million times. There's no need for me to do that. There's nothing I'm gonna add any different than anyone else has, hasn't already. So sometimes I take all those things together and you mash them together and there, there'll be different ideas that come from all over. You know, like there are things like on, like I'll, I'll, I won't go into too many different artists, but we'll say Miles Davis, Bitches Brew. There are chords that Zalanol hits on that record. I'm like, what the fuck is that? That's the sickest chord. And I'll be like, I don't know how to do that. I don't even know what that is. I can't even figure it out. Tony, what is this? And he goes, you like that? And I'm like, yeah, can you do that? And he goes, yeah, that's just like, it's, yeah, it's just whatever. And he just plays it and goes, that, that's what you want? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, okay, that's not really a chord. It's just, you know, it's an interval thing. And he goes, and then we'll play it. And he goes, okay, but you want, I understand what you want. You don't want it to resolve. Zalimol doesn't resolve it. And I go, yeah, that's what I like about it. So there is things in music that we that we hear, like little things, sparse things, when we listen to music that pull us in. Um, that was why I liked early hip hop. Like I like Public Enemy and stuff because you took people that were not necessarily musicians and they kind of selected, right? They were sampling, right? Or like Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique. You could take that. That's That's probably the best example of a music collage record. Um, there are a lot of things that break the rules there. You could never even make that record today if you wanted to, because you couldn't afford to pay for the samples. There were no samples, sample laws back then. So that's a very unique record. It's like right. a funk collection record, right? And they took sparse things from all over the, of, of all things that they loved, and they made a collage of a record, and then and they sang over it, and they, and they put their magic on top of it. And that record sounds that way, because I think you have a lot of musicians that are not really technically don't know the rules they're just strictly going by their soul and what they and what they makes them feel good it makes them feel makes the music feel a certain way and that's what makes those magic of some of those type of records and then there are records like we were just talking about you could take like like david bowie and lennon doing the song fame right and it's like the most concise dance song you've ever heard with musicians that all know exactly what the fuck they're doing 
and it's just pulls you in the same way and creates a certain feeling. So it goes both ways. It just depends where you're coming from. Some people can't listen to records when, when things get too avant-garde like that. That's when you lose certain people. Like when I was mentioning my wife with the Frankenstein song. Yeah, yeah, totally. She, she, she listens to the original version. It's concise and it's brought down. It's still, but anything that gets too abstract and out of there, it kind of loses her. So you have to, it's, it's that like little bit of like how much, how much of the, do you move the lever into that, into that world and how much don't you, you know what I mean? So the balance of it all, but you know, it's that's funny. Kind of you mentioned that you mentioned Frankenstein and um, there's a funny aside to that is uh, it made me think immediately of like a few years ago, I went to go see Hall and Oates at uh, the PNC arts center down here in Jersey. And uh, my drummer is a huge fan of, of Hall and Oates. He loves them. It's like a thing. Every time they come, the PNC Arts Center, like this outdoor, like you know, summertime, like amphitheater type thing. He goes with his wife, and they make a thing out of it. So, so a couple of years ago, they played, and um, he's like, "Oh, Mike, well, come down." The tickets are like five dollars or something. The day uh, if you go, if you wait, you know, until the day of the show, you can get tickets for like ten dollars or whatever to these events, sit on a lawn and that kind of thing. So, you know, I had nothing to do. I weeknight. I, I got a ticket. I went down, and everyone knows the hits, the Hall and Oates hits, you know. But when they play them live, they're like six minute versions of those songs. They have all these different guys on stage, different instruments like synths, you know, keyboards, strings, all that stuff, sax. And the songs, they really, they really expand into a different, complete experience when you see it live, you know? Oh, right. And it's like, you know, like, we're, I don't even know the names of some of these songs, like Rosanna or whatever, you know, like that becomes a completely different song live, you know? And it, it's just interesting how, you can imagine you, you kind of get a feel for the real maybe the truth behind that band is that they are a bunch of dudes to like the jam and then the producers they got cuts everything edits it down to this bite-sized thing that gets consumed by the public and becomes yep. hit singles you know and one thing i got it one more one last thing about hall and oates i have to say is there's daryl hall and there's john oates right daryl hall gray hair beard john oates his shit's like jet black, dude. Like beard, <laughs> hair, everything. It's like a fucking guy. It's like, I'm like, his hair was so black that I, it was like the darkest abyss, man. I was like, they, they would have a, they would flash those guys up on the, the LED monitors, you know, and like, you know, Daryl Hall looked like a guy his age. And then John Oates looked like a dude, like a 70 year old guy, like wearing a disguise or something like that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it was just yeah. funny. Yeah. So back to the record, man. So the uh, Veil of the Fallen, it's about to come out on Spart Records. And Spart did the, the uh, first album. And uh, pre-order is still up. Vinyl, CD, digital, right? Is the, the, And all that stuff is released at the same time. Is that that's true? Yep, everything's coming out on that day. I like Spart. They've been they've been pretty good to us. We had spoken earlier, I think it was like maybe last year, and when I was looking for maybe to move to like a different label or something. And I don't know, man. They've been pretty cool. Listen, I'm 54. If someone wants to put my records out. I'm grateful that someone wants to put my records out. You know, I mean, um, the people that are that are on that label are probably you know half my age. It could be my children. You know, so um they've been kind of supportive i mean do i make a living from my music no but i would i would still write music whether i had a record label or not it's like something i do you know like i just i like creating stuff like a like someone who likes to paint you know or do any other type of art form it's some i like the the art form part of it i like the creative process so if they want to be supportive of it and they want to put the records out i'm all for it um it's not a windfall but i feel like they were they were pretty fair to us they put the first record out uh they're putting all the winter stuff out you know that new live winter record too i think that's actually out right now um which by the way is better than into darkness in my in, in my personal opinion um and yeah they, they've been pretty good to us i really have no i have no issues with them um you know Voss brought up a really good point to me she said when we were looking for another label, I said, yeah, but we can go on, we can, you know, we have, we can go on a bigger label now, you know, we have another record out. She goes, for what reason? And I go, well, you know, it would be better for us. She goes, how would it be better? 
And I was like, well, because it's a bigger label. She goes, okay. So say you go to a bigger label. Uh, say you go to, I don't know, we'll say Warner Brothers. Okay. Are you ready to drop your whole entire life and go on tour? I mean, you know, I'm not 20 years old, right? I'm just being honest, right? Could you? I says, no, I don't think I could do that because, you know, I have like, you know, my life's in a, a different stage right now, right? So sure. she goes, you would have to be able to sacrifice everything that you have to be on that label. Could you do that? And it says, I don't necessarily think I could do that. And she goes, then Spar is the perfect label. You have a label that's going to su support you. They're going to put your records out. They're not going to necessarily obviously we're going to play some shows and support the record or something like that. There's a proper festival to do it at, but I won't be required to be on the road all year round. Now, if you said that to me during like the early winter thorn days, I would have cut my fucking balls off to do that. Right. But now it's life's a little bit different and I don't need money from a record label to make my records. I don't borrow a penny from them. I basically that record, uh, like, the garden records specifically i press those records myself i record it, engineer it, produce it edit it master it i do all the artwork graphics everything i hand them a complete record and they just license it and they put it out that is it i don't borrow any money from them or anything i keep all my publishing and everything and that's kind of a nice place to be um i keep my cinch rights everything and i find that to be more valuable to someone like me at this point. Whereas if I went to a bigger label, they would take everything, yeah, right? Totally. I wouldn't be able to own any of that. Not that that matters because those things are not really making me income. Like this is total 100% passion to do the music. These are musicians who are making music with me and collaborating with me because they love music and they want to make music. That's it. It's pure as it could be. Why? Because there is no necessarily big money involved in it or anything to do it, right? There's no, there's no, anyone who's involved in it is involved in it because they want to be involved in it, not because there's some kind of uh, financial reason to be part of it. So I find that is almost like freedom. And, the, and like we talked about earlier, not to get too far off of it, the fact that we can record and make our own records and do everything we can, like the videos and stuff with iPhones and everything, is even better. And it does empower younger music in the future obviously it puts a lot of stuff out into the world that probably shouldn't be because there is no distillation factor right so people just put shit out in two seconds and whatever but yeah that's my uh, that's my perception of it at least you know maybe it is better why not start school you know they have worldwide distribution they're not the yeah. biggest boys on the block but but they're cool with me but, yeah but the thing is too nowadays it's like you know with with the sort of populist popularization whatever of the, of the digital platform, you know, like your record is going to be out there on next to whatever the new behemoth record. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not, it's right. going to be, it's going to be like normalized. Like everything is going to be at the same level when it comes to uh, people putting together playlists or these coverage and all that sort of stuff. It's like, you know, a garden track could, could set, conceivably be in the same playlist as like some sort of like behemoth track or, you know, cannibal corpse or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, so it's going to reach the same people. And I think, and you got, you know, Freeman's doing PR for you guys and he's a good guy. We work with Freeman for, yep. for one record on relapse and, um, you know, he's a solid PR publicist guy. So, you know, why, why, why stress, you know? And the other thing too, is like with um, the larger labels and that goes down to even like your metal blades and, you know, relapses and all this other stuff, like you're never going to, you know, it's so difficult to recoup expenses because of the, percentage royalty rate that things are recouped by you know it's not like dollar dollar for dollar it's like <laughs> totally well since on the dollar. I, listen I, i'm in the negative from day one on both of those records and you yeah, know what man. i don't fucking give a shit that i'm fucking yeah. I, I, I ain't about the money it, i can give i can fucking care less about that part of it it yeah. means nothing to me i got a job where i make money doing what i love doing anyway and my fitness and my rehab and all my shit I got love over there too. So to me, it's strictly about the art form, you know, and that, that freedom of being able to do that, I think is going to make better records even going forward. I'm going to do another record. Why not? I got nothing to lose. As long as Spar will put them out, that's cool. Whatever. What else am I going to do? I don't hang out in bars. I don't like, 
you know, do anything. I geek out with my friends. Those are legitimately my friends. Jason, Voss, Tony, Margaret's a new friend that I met doing the record and all the other people that are involved in it. They're probably people I'd hang out with anyway. So why not? To me, to me, it's a winner. Um, so yeah, that's uh, it's, it's, I feel like it's in a good place, you know, energetically it's, I feel like it's in a really good, I'm, I'm in a good place with it, you know, uh, um, I'm a geek. Look, I'm sitting around thousands of CDs and I got a whole closet full of fucking records too. I'm a, I'm a music uh, geek, you know? So, um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I think it's cool. I'm down, man. I can't wait. I mean, I'm, I'm still, <laughs> I've heard the entire, I've listened to the entire record a bunch of times and vinyl is going to ship shortly. I'm looking forward to putting out on my, the rest of you know, my collection. And, um, you know, just seeing the large format is nice too, you know? So yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. And, uh, Definitely uh, keep keep me in the loop as far as like live performances go. You know what I mean. Let me know what's up with the live setting. You know, maybe we can yeah, definitely. Something. I'll keep I'll keep you posted. I did want to say one thing before we break though. That winter album, the new live record. The reason I like it better than Into Darkness, hands down. That record is what winter fucking sounds like. So. When we did Into Darkness, there was no keyboards on it. Me and John sat there when the record was done. And we said, it's missing something. And I says, it's missing keyboards. It's missing like all the shit we love. At that point, when we were doing Into Darkness, we were already into Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, Floyd, and all kinds of stuff. We said, it needs keyboards. Tony used to manage a record store in Long Island called Titus Oaks. We met him, we went in his basement. Our friend Bob Barry introduced us to him. We went in his basement, he had a fucking mini move there. He was just hitting a couple of things, make it, he was tuning up the move, right? You had to get the oscillators right. And I'm like, yo, Tony, what is that? What is that? And he goes, dude, I'm just tuning the thing up, man. I'm like, that's a cool sound, right? And we use those sounds like in Power and Might, it was making all these drippy noises and shit. And he just played on the record. He never played with us. As, in, as a, in a room with us and created the music. He came in as an afterthought because we knew we needed something else. So, and the drums were kind of all over the map a little as far as the time, because we were trying to play really slow and was, you know, and listen, we were like 18 years old then, right? 1988, I was 18. So yeah. we were not musicians yet. We were still didn't know what we were doing. But when we did this, when we played that show, we had already played Roadburn, we already played Maryland Death Fest. We already toured a little bit. We had like a little resurgence. And Jimmy Jackson came with us. Jimmy was our friend. Jimmy used to be just playing like discharge groups with us and punk rock groups. We grew up together. We were used to playing with each other. I could look at Jimmy and know that he was coming down on the fucking, on, a, on like a, a piece. I just looked at him. I knew what he was doing. You know what I mean? And we had that connection already. Jimmy jumped in with us. And he didn't even play double kick, Jimmy. He learned how to play double kick just for winter. He's a single kick player, always was. And we were really tight then. And at that point, Tony had already been playing with us. So that that live recording is the best, as far as I'm concerned, that is the best um, version of winter you'll ever get. And there is no other live recording with Tony. Tony okay. only played that in Brooklyn because Tony will not get on a plane. He has never played with us anywhere live. That is it. So, and it's in our hometown. It's in Brooklyn. You know what I mean? Like Tony just had to get in his car and go there. That was it. So we were able to get him to play with us. And I think we're super tight for, and that is, that is what we sound like. No studio production, nothing. Throw a bunch of fucking mics in front of us and we played. And it was in our hometown. So anyone who's, uh, that's not just some live record that we put out to make a couple of bucks. You know what I mean? It was it was just a great live show, you know? And it was, you know, anyway, that's my thoughts. Oh, I got a follow-up question to that. So remember remember when Winter, when we all, we played together, Tombs, Winter, Neurosis, uh, at Maryland Death Fest that year? Yeah. Remember that? Oh, he did play with us that night. Yeah, right, that yeah was, okay. All right, that's a. I was trying okay. to visualize. I was trying to yeah. visualize who was behind the who was playing synth on that keyboards, and so that was Tony too, right? That was Tony because he can get in a car and go to that. He drive the Baltimore. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> he could get in a car and drive with us at that point. That any All plane right. thing, he's out. 
I was trying to visualize who was playing on that because I, I didn't really know you guys that much back then. You know what I mean? I remember watching the band and I was like, who's all right. Was Tony playing with the band? No, no, it was Tony. You're right. You're right. That was the only other show he played with us. If we played, it would have, you remember the 18 Mr. T wouldn't get on the plane. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To, like <laughs> stick him in the ass with like a thing and like knock him out. And then they drag him on the plane. <laughs> That's what we have to do to Tony. If we played a gig, you know, we have to like, you know, <laughs> but yeah, that was, um, Anyway, that's my thoughts on that record too. I know that that was just released a couple of weeks ago as well on Spark. So, well, yeah, there you have it, man. Thanks a lot, Steph. I appreciate it, and um, it's great talking to you. We need we need to stay, you know, do this more often, even informally. You know what I'm saying? So, um, definitely. definitely keep me in the loop, and um, everyone out there, make sure you check out the new uh, Godden record, uh, Veil of the Fallen. And uh, if you haven't ordered it yet, uh, just do me a favor and go to the Spark. Uh, website and hit, hit that pre-order and uh, pick up a, a LP vinyl version of this great record that's coming out. Sounds good. Mike, thanks for having me. Of course. Anytime, bro.